Welcome to day two of the Festival of Dam 2022. It's great to see so many of you joining us online today. Feel free to let us know where you're joining us from in the live chat tab of this session. Delighted to welcome your conference chair and chair of track one today, David Lipsy. David, thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Tom, Welcome thanks so much. Today. It's a delight to be here. Welcome to day two of the Festival of Dam. Thank you to our attendees from all across the globe who help us to celebrate all things digital asset management. We also thank our sponsors, of course, for their support in the event. Please visit them throughout the conference via the exhibition tab to find out more. Now, on with the show. We, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Jonathan Wares from Flowers Bakeries, as he takes us through his presentation, We Know We Need a Dam, But We Don't Know Why. Now, Jonathan was paying close attention to my little lesson about dam geology and the Videolithic and other Im Imagezoic eras. Well, not really, um, but he draws on, on deep experience all the way down to dam bedrock, and I've had, Jonathan, such an enjoyable time working with you on the presentation. Looking forward to it. I'll turn this over to you, and I'll be back with the questions uh, that will come in from everybody as you wrap up. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, David, for the introduction. I am Jonathan Ware. Welcome, festival goers, and thank you for joining me for the Festival of Dam presentation. The reason for my presentation silly title is every business that I've worked with in the past that's been newly introduced to digital asset management tells me, you know, Jonathan, we know we need a dam, but we really don't know why. In most cases, company X has hired a consultant, or maybe they even attended a Henry Stewart event, and the company X is now convinced that they need a dam, but why? They've been sold on the idea but they still wonder, what's the return on investment? What's the ultimate benefit of spending the time and money to organize our assets and data? So today we'll talk about making the initial case for DAM, ways to build metrics for ROI and KPIs. And I'll use real life examples to show that while achieving the additional intentional planned results of a DAM, you can also yield unexpected additional return on investment finally wrap up with recommendations for ongoing ROI exploration. In making the initial case for DAM, many of the same justifications apply across all industries. So let's dive into why we all need a DAM. For those not familiar with my current and uh, former and current employers listed here, let me first give you a brief introduction. Uh, NASCAR, if you've never seen it, is a sport where cars turn left for hours. Uh, NASCAR Media Group is the film and television arm of NASCAR, producer of short and long form content and owner of all footage rights for the sport. Academy Sports and Outdoors is a billion dollar big box retailer selling sportswear and sports equipment. Then there's a California Academy of Sciences, which is one of the world's largest natural history museums and research facilities. And my current employer, Flowers Foods, second largest bakery in the US, serving up the likes of Dave's Killer Bread and Wonder Bread. Now, what do all these industries have in common when it comes to needing a dam system? What are the same challenges they all face? Well, first, it's siloed workflows. We are working in silos. We have disconnected asset creation workflows. We have disconnected data workflows. There's a lack of visibility into the process and progress. Where are our assets now? And what's the data related to those assets? Second, we have an inability to share. We're storing assets on desktops, hard drives, Dropbox, Teams, and SharePoint sites. Everything is everywhere all at once, right? Our, our colleagues don't know what content is available to use because we have no avail ability to commonly share it. Then there's a lack of trust. If I do happen to find an asset, do I need to keep a copy forever on my desktop because I may not find it again? Or is it even the right version, the latest version? And am I going to get sued if I use it this way? And then finally, value not realized. And what do I mean by that? If we are working in silos and not sharing, and we are misusing an asset, 
then we are limiting its value through mismanagement. By instilling the disciplines of digital asset management, we're giving ourselves the ability to repeatedly reuse an asset in its original form, to repurpose that asset for new uses, and we're giving ourselves the ability to limit use, to prevent oversaturation in the marketplace, which could dilute its value. By managing an asset properly, we give that asset life beyond its origin and extending its life increases its value. The criteria for these, this is not the only criteria obviously, but the criteria, these four criteria for making the initial case for DAM, these shared company pains, I have seen from TV production to retail, to science, to bakeries, and fortunately, Digital asset management is the solution. Building metrics around a return on investment and key performance indicators, it's not simple or straightforward, and even less so in the dam world. It requires dissecting as is processes into quantifiable segments, attaching weight and even sometimes meaning to glean a financial impact. Traditional ROI and KPI calculations do not always apply to dam technology. And build, but building a, a financial case is important. And here are a few examples for building ROI and KPI metrics from my past and present. At California Academy of Sciences, we use different roles to estimate return on investment. The first scenario here being Alex and his internal creative team developing a new museum exhibition. So here we focused on the time and money savings gained by instead of using the old stale stock imagery from external sources to now using the dam's new archive of content and the higher quality that would yield. And we also tried to measure intangibles like autonomy and frustration level and the ability to collaborate. And we, determine outcomes to those benefits, like freeing up resources to advance other projects. The second Academy of Sciences ROI scenario focuses on the science research, time spent cataloging data into antiquated, unprotected databases. Not only was it time consuming to catalog and costly, the risk of losing it all was extremely high, eliminating any trust to share the data in a collaborative way. Changing to a digital asset management system increased overall speed to catalog and reduce cost, but the larger, more meaningful outcome was that it bolstered wider collaboration across research facilities due to newfound trust in the system to protect the data. Here is a sample of key performance indicators I'm working on for flowers. It's still a work in progress, so please don't judge. But we can start with the top two listed here. I, I use these in, in just about every installation. In efficiencies gained through findability and reuse slash overuse. Uh, we're currently conducting surveys internally with stakeholders to find out how often users are searching, for how long, how much it costs to retrieve an asset from an agency, uh, cost to recreate an asset, and other factors to calculate the financial impacts prior to implementing DAM technology. I won't get the other two here, those are flower specific, specific. Uh, but it is important to determine four to six KPIs early and dig deep uh, to acquire benchmark baseline metrics to use as comparison once DAM functionality is in place. Next, I want to use uh, some of my past experiences to show the difference between the goals you set out to achieve with a new dam system and the surprising bonus dividends that are unexpected, unplanned, but still can be quantified in the true measurable return on investment. Back in 2005, in the early infancy of dam technology, I joined NASCAR Media Group with a mission to preserve the sports archi archive. We were producing over 400 hours of new content weekly, and the library already held over 90,000 hours of video dating back to the 1920s on physical formats from the latest HD media to film and three-quarter tape and one-inch reels. 
much of that older content deteriorating by the day and in danger of being lost forever the next time it's used. For instance, th the three quarter tape we owned had to be baked in convection ovens for six hours at low temperature to ensure the elements didn't flake off the tape as it spun round the reels on playback. We invested in a dozen HD streams uh, to ingest for our, in, our digitization operations and a team of 20 loggers, people working day and night to dissect the footage, tag it with metadata, identifying drivers and car numbers and action on and off the track. And then our teams of editors and producers would mine the system for footage to tell their stories. This was the initial goal and the intended result of the dam. But beyond archiving the history of the sport and serving production, we wanted to give our sales teams the ability to market our content. The metadata we related to our most spectacular footage, particularly names of hood sponsors, gave the footage additional value and we were able to increase our footage rights fees because of it. Due to the speed of our dam operations, ingest and metadata tagging, we were able to quickly produce best in class race recaps and compete with the likes of NBC Olympics to win sports Emmy awards three years running. And then the SEC came calling. Now we evangelized our operations to anyone who would listen. And next thing we know, an SEC squad took notice and asked us to take on their library of sports content. It was exciting. We thought we were gonna start logging football games instead of racing. But what was most important to this SEC group and our conversation today was not football, sadly. They had people for that, coaches and whatnot. No, what they needed from a dam system was to document for their ad sponsors how frequent and long their ads ran on a Jumbotron scoreboard at the stadium to prove to the sponsors that they were paying for and getting what they were paying for in order to sell them additional sponsorships. Now that's boring stuff to log in a dam system, but talk about raw ROI, right? They're, they're trying to prove to those sponsors that their, their investment is being paid off by using a dam system. We would not have known when we started out our mission to preserve the NASCAR archives that the dam system would then yield these additional unforeseen revenue streams and rewards for excellence. My next dam adventure kicked off in 2012 in Academy Sports and Outdoors with the goal of populating the e-commerce site. The COO was tired of going to the Academy e-commerce website and seeing image coming soon or no image available for products and made a rule shortly after I was hired that Academy would no longer sell any product on its website without an image, which meant thousands of products were removed from the website at that time. Merchants were scrambling to prioritize their products with our photo studio to repopulate the website. And the chief marketing officer told us, you know, while you're at it, make sure every product image is styled uniformly as well. We don't want to see humans in some and different angles in others. Make it all the same. So the initial goal was to feed the e-commerce beast. And we did. We, we made it complete and uniform. But along the way at Academy, I saw the first opportunity to integrate DAM with PIM, Product Information Management. The merchant team adopted a new purchasing system introducing this randomly generated product ID, an ID that would break our existing links between our products and our assets naming conventions. So we, create, we created a, a new universal product ID to bridge between the systems, a bridge that would give us one common ID across the merchant, DAM and PIM systems. Once that integration was made, we were able to populate weekly advertising templates inside the PIM system with assets through automated delivery from the DAM system based on that new naming convention, eliminating hundreds of hours of monthly manual asset placement into those templates. That bo those bonus hour, dividend hours were then redirected back toward quality improvements and other critical projects. At California Academy of Sciences, there was a 43 million specimen backlog to digitize. 
The idea was to make a digital representation of every single museum specimen, all 43 million, and relate it to its research data. So photographing butterflies and bumblebees dancing on pins and taking 3D scans of fish and snakes floating in jars and then associating the digital assets with the scientists' databases of research. And we built that relationship. We used Darwin Core metadata modeling, and I used my seventh grade biology merit badge to merit digital specimens with their scientific records. But thankfully, the Academy of Sciences researchers in the field immediately saw the benefit, and they asked to take the dam on the road on research expeditions. They began uploading field notes and images from, lo from, from location directly into the specimen records inside the dam in real time, where scientists back on campus in California and around the world could access the assets and data immediately. And also our educational teams inside the museum were able to build lesson plans using scientific assets and data now available to them. More importantly, without the assistance of those research teams. And they now started taking those lessons outside the museum to classrooms around the country because it was all neatly packaged and current in the dam system. Now, this type of rapid adoption is quite rare. And these unexpected initiations were a huge boost to mass adoption for all users across Academy. Which brings us to my current installation at Flowers Foods. Flowers does not have a dam or a PIM, uh, so I have been enlisted to build both from scratch. Uh, the system is being built to number one, act as a PIM to house product specifications like G10, weights and measures, as well as marketing data like customer facing product names, descriptions, features and benefits, combined with number two, the ability to use dam functionality to associate all related assets like product images, recipes, campaigns, and video ads to those product records. It'll be used by brand business units, marketing, food service operations, retail sales teams, and creative agencies. Each of our brand teams currently operate in silos, sound familiar? So we are building a secure central repository and then match the dam with equally robust product data PIM capability. Now we do not go live until January at Flowers, so I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that I know the extent of the bonus dividends that the system will bring our operations yet. But what I do know so far with Flowers is that our project is shining a bright light on the ugly truth of data integrity, that we have multiple systems upstream and downstream of the dam PIM system that are not aligned with accurate matching data. And we do not have a single trustworthy source of truth. And if nothing else, in, in refusing to populate our new dam PIM system with bad data, we're forcing a reckoning among system owners and data owners to get the data right. Uh, we will build a system that can be trusted. So finally, in the, uh, I'll uh, give a recap, I guess, in the form of recommendations. Um, there's four areas uh, to focus attention to, for ongoing continued exploration of ROI. Determine the true value of the assets. What's the cost of creating them? How long do they stay on the shelf and how, what is their usage? potential? What does it cost if we have losses of assets and have to recreate them? Explore system integration advances. What does data uniformity give you? What, what, what does, how does that create additional pipelines and additional workflow capability? Discover the benefits of sharing assets and data, the collaboration and knowledge transfer, removing time between, between that transfer and up uncovering the true value of the data, the cost of being wrong and the effort to fix it, manage it across multiple systems. And my recommendations for building your own case, your own justification for a dam, for ROI and KPI is to start digging into those as is business processes today. What are the pain points? What costs money and time? What causes delays or fines? But more importantly, what grows in value? 
How long does it hold value? And when does the cost of management exceed its value or usefulness? It's been a pleasure to share my experiences with you, the Henry Stewart community at this Festival of Dam. And I'm happy to field any questions you may have at this time. Jonathan, thanks so much. Um, it was so fun working with you and getting familiar with a bit of behind the scenes planning for what's going to go on at Flowers. And in addition to the, the thoughtful grounding that they were lucky enough to have to find you to bring to this project. And I know as the months unfold, we'll look forward to hearing to number four being all informed and a follow. And it, it's fun to think about, okay, it's November, 2023. What's Jonathan going to tell us happened? At Flowers? <laughs> so, so I have some, uh, I have another screen over here on my right. And if you'll forgive my off camera manners for a moment or side camera, I'm going to just look at some questions that have come in. Sure. What, and here's one, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing those at the very start of a dam journey? Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll confess at Flowers, we, we did things a little backwards. Uh, there, there was a team that went out and, and started looking for a vendor um, before proper discovery uh, took place. And, uh, you know, they, they hired me kind of the, on, the, on the end of, of deciding which vendor to go with. I was like, oh, I wish I had about nine months of discovery to, to really figure out what's, what's the full list of recommendations mm -hmm. and requirements that we need for this system uh, prior to getting started. So I think jumping ahead a too, too quickly is, is one of the mistakes that are made that really take the time to do your discovery to understand you know the, the scope of the assets and the scope of the data that's going to be required and the and the teams within the company that's going to take to get that off the ground and i think in 2022 and on the cusp of 2023 that's not an onerous process today we we know no. how to create what we need to prototype and to and we know which vendors are going to fit what kind of circumstances there's such a rich set of solutions that someone looking for DAM can turn towards, as well as this peer community that you represent and everyone who's speaking here at the festival and who we hear at the live events. And, and I think your guidance there, uh, it really comes out of the big book of boo-boos. Do the discovery and the prototyping first. And then you'll be working with engaged vendors that are appropriate to all the different needs and the, the many facets of the market that can be served by the, the technologies. Yeah. And we want to keep that big book of boo-boos closed. Uh, just to close that book. So. Yes, I, I would love somebody to, to learn from my mistakes and use me as an example of what not to do. In fact. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I, I do think do that's right part, of first. The, it's part of what we do at Henry Stewart is to coalesce insights and to make sure that we are, I'll continue it to, we're looking at a, a, a persistence of an unbroken continuum of ever getting better and better at this. Yes. And we kind of know where I'll continue it, kind of the fault lines and the plates are shifting down there to be aware of. Well, and I'll also give Flowers credit. They did give me the time to take a step back and do the proper discovery in order to, to make sure that we're configuring the, the first, first release of our system properly. Nice. Um, and, it, and it's certainly been a, been a success so far. Another question's come in. Uh, excuse my ignorance. When we talk about PIM, is it only related to commercial projects, i.e., could PIM be used for internal projects? Well, uh, you know, there are a lot of systems uh, that can handle and manage product data. Um, you know, we're we're being fed data from systems upstream, like a master data governance system, a uh, product lifecycle management system, uh, SAP systems. There are other tools that that are mm -hmm. that are to do a great job in managing data. What we're trying to do with a PIM, and what what I've found so useful about the the concept of a PIM, 
is that you can marry specification data about about a product, but you can also marry the the romance language, the flowery language, the marketing content that you need to sell that product. Um, so you really kind of have a merging of both the technical aspects of a product and the, and the sales aspect of a product. So for me, that's the advantage of a mm -hmm. PIM tool. Um, and now that you have these, these, these jam systems that integrate PIM technology, which I'm working with now at Flowers, it's even a, it's even a, a, a greater blessing but you, because you can make that relationship in one system, the assets to the product data and the marketing data. Yeah, and, and I think that this very un, unignorant question um, tickles a lot of the functionality of PIM. One of the things to take what Jonathan just said and, and expand it a little bit, we can approach DAM looking across unexplored terrain within wherever we work. One of the things I really like to do is to always go around when I have the chance to be doing a bit of discovery work and say, well, Jonathan, let's go meet everybody at Flowers who get questions. Okay, questions. Hmm. And one of the places that this takes us in the corporate sector is often left alone in, in DAM for reasons that befuddle me to this day, which is customer service. And you can bet Flowers gets calls every day about ingredients, about now, is this always gluten-free? Is there a version of it that's not? And is it kosher? There's so many food questions. And one of the most innovative uses that we're seeing where DAM and PIM come together is driving the questions that are asked way upstream in PIM. So the mm -hmm. answers come along with the products and are available for the label generation and for customer service staff. And I think that's so, it, it, it's one of those ROI opportunities. Right. That we then, in the way we make this manifest and the food industry and the clothing industry lead this is by the use of sm so-called smart labels or engagement <clears throat> labels. Maybe it's a QR code, maybe it's a URL, whatever. In the fabric, in the fashion industry, the QR code, say on a smart label that's on the packaging which also comes from another system, leads to engagement information, say about country of origin. Right. Clothing manufacturers get phone calls every day. Was this made in a country that I don't want to buy clothing from? And if I can absolve the need of somebody being paid an hourly rate to answer that question, and then they <laughs> yes. say, thanks for looking this up. By the way, here are the wash and wear instructions. Yes. Or here's some interesting recipes. I've had a one-to-one -one connection with a customer. Yes. And the value of that, speaking to your thoughtful presentation on ROI, it is hard to actually calculate um, because it's worth so much money to then say, well, Mr. Weir, thanks for calling today. I'd also like to email you a coupon in appreciation for engaging with us and, and your question. And how much money is that worth? Right on, and and we and it's funny because our our damn PIM system is supposed to bubble up the content that we need, just like you're saying that kind of enhanced content that can shine a light on allergens and and GMO certifications and those type mm -hmm. of things, and 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 call those out for the customer right you know right at the marketplace at the digital marketplace. So, absolutely. Yeah, it, it absolutely goes to ROI calculations, both on, mm -hmm. on social impact. You know, I, you've heard me speak about return on investment, return on impact, yeah. and return on information. And looking at that, that golden triad there, um, this kind of engagement label or engagement information goes to, to ROI measured through each one of those in some very interesting yeah, One of our ways. KPIs is absolutely the quality of the digital shelf and what we're mm -hmm. putting up there to, to yeah. enhance the content for the, for the customer. And I think another important comment that's that's kind of effervesced right out of your career is to also understand that for those of us who are here today in the festival and working around the world for libraries and archives and museums, that the product information data structures that Jonathan is commenting on are highly analogous to collections management software. Um, and, and it's 
useful to take the insights that he shared and think about, ah, okay, I have structural information. It's probably in collections management systems. How does that help me to think through data interchange and other ways in which I can get more information in DAM, which is the connection to the world, when I've got, when I think PIM, even though I'm really working with perhaps even a very aged collections management software. And by the way, what was that gift from the California Academy of Sciences? Is that like a, a, a stegosaurus bone? What was that? <laughs> that? That was from the ichthyology department. That was okay. some sort of fish. <laughs> okay, all right. So I wasn't completely off. I had the fin thing kind of, <laughs> thing kind of working. Well, we've had another question come in and let me turn to the side and look. Jonathan, do you have any tips on end user interviews in building quantifiable KPIs? Did the discovery process, as you reflect on your various organizations where you've worked, vary? Well, I would say that the, the end user groups varied from, from installation to installation. Uh, you know, right now, like I said, we were doing, we're doing surveys with a lot of the end users to just understand the impact of, of what we're bringing to the table is going to change. Um, I'll just use kind of a, a very detailed example. The, the brand business units and the marketing teams are kind of the only ones who know what assets exist and what is the proper and accurate data for any of our products. And so everybody funnels all of their queries to them. And so we're, we're focusing on those two roles specifically to say, how many times are you getting pinged for searching for assets, looking for a lifestyle image? How long does it take you to go hmm. find that? that specific one for that specific product and, and cough it up for whoever's asking for it, you know, really putting hard numbers around what it takes to get your job done today. And then that's what we propose as the ROI and then create a KPI around that. And mm -hmm. so that's what we're tracking once the system is up and running. So, you know, making sure that, you know, all of those people who are going to those those roles asking for things, they're now fishing the system themselves. We've taught them how to fish and they don't have to go to that one person anymore. So you had 50 requests a month for assets. Now you have zero mm -hmm. because everybody else has, go, has been uh, integrated into the new dam system and, and they've been trained to, to find those assets themselves. Those are the type of things that we're trying to, to dig up, those real numbers, those real things that are happening in people's lives that, that, that create time savings that they get back to do their real jobs. And what a nice thing to be able to both statistically take a view of as well as graphically. Um, it's one of the, one of the un, still kind of, I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll use my word, in damn cognito, you know, terra in cognito, terra in damn cognito. <laughs> One of the unmapped areas in our field is kind of a, a reference book on reporting. It's something I'd really like yeah. to see happen as we open up the, the International Center up at Toronto Metropolitan University to have uh, just a, an information clearinghouse where we can go take that example you just gave and translate it into a report shell. And then do a, right. a graphic ideation because it's fun to watch the growth of the number of assets, the growth of the number of resolved searches, the diminishment of repeated searches like that. So I mean, there's a, there's there's so much that is is soft uh, about about ROI mm -hmm. when it when it comes to the damn world, but there are real numbers that 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 you can show money saved. Yeah, we had a, a very specific question that someone sent to me that I, I'll pass along and we'll wrap up with this. It's someone that um, clearly you know, goes to the grocery store and reads the grocery store publication. And they said, do the coupons I see for Dave's bread come from you or from an agency? And if so, will the agency have access to the dam? So great question. Uh, we have a shopper marketing team that creates coupons and 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 does that with the help of agencies. Um, so uh, we we are the we're the we're the creators of of the 
copy for those uh, coupons and, and holders of the UPC, if you will. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Well, I want to thank you, Jonathan, for the chance to have spent the time together that we did in getting ready for today, but particularly the time and knowledge that you shared to help uh, our Festival of Dam continue to provide such great information to the peer user community around the world. And I look forward to talking with you again soon and hopefully seeing you soon too. It's been a pleasure, David. Thank you so much. Thank you all great. for joining. Take good care. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.